Hello, it's Scott Manley, and welcome to Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. We have a fair chunk of cash in hand, and so uh, it's time to start doing some upgrades. We're going to upgrade the runway, it, partly because it will give me a smoother landing. I might actually be able to land something on it, but also it will help me you know, gr put a b bit more mass on it. I've also set an upgrade for the astronaut complex. Those are going to take the better part of a year. While I'm at it, it's worth looking at the strategies here. And I think I seem to be doing a pretty good job in terms of reputation. And I feel that money is actually going to be my limitation here. We're going to need to spend a lot of money on upgrades I don't need to spend in the stock version. So I think this is a good way to go. It basically will take some of the reputation. And I don't tend to kill too many pilots, fingers crossed, other than poor Vadim. Okay, I've killed the most famous pilot, but I don't intend to kill any more pilots. So we're going to go do with the fundraising campaign, taking my reputation and converting it into sweet, sweet space bucks. Okay, so uh, next, um, do I want to... No, and of course, I don't want to upgrade any of those things because they don't help me. No, to the contracts, to mission control. Hey, Gene. So we have some crew altitude records and things like that. We have a science data around the Earth. That is going to be pretty easy since I can just pop a sounding rocket up there. Now, since we're sending sounding rockets up at 436 kilometers, I think it should be easy enough. Notice this is being this is Strutco, hopefully not the same company that is selling struts to SpaceX. Uh, yeah, 400. Um, let me just think. Yeah, so I'm going to have to build a slightly bigger rocket, but I can definitely make this worthwhile. Um, yeah, select that. And sounding rocket high, that is going to be 1,676 kilometers. That is going to be a major stretch, but it is a bit more cash. 1,000, 2,000. So we should probably do this because it will get us a little more cash and everything, and it's good to go for these altitudes. Real shoot are asking me to do that. I'm not sure shoots are going to be involved. Okay, so since we're getting into bigger rockets, it's good if I can have the vehicle assembly building working better, but because I have multiple launch sites, I can have uh, each launch site have different, uh, you know, development levels. I can have one launch site which specializes in the vehicle assembly building, the other one which specifies in the space plane hangar. So, this is Wallops. Wallops refers to Wallops Island, which is just, uh, I think it's near Virginia or something. So we're just going to, uh, wait a second, space plane hangar. No, no, definitely. Vehicle assembly building put points into that. Wallops Island was established as a uh, flight testing center or whatever in the 1940s. But it, mostly it would do like, you know, tests. So they would like test capsules and things like that before they were actually launched from Cape Canaveral. And of course, I have been doing a bunch of testing. This is my Soundwave Extreme. It is, well, it is beyond a sounding rocket. This thing costs almost 800 credits or funds or whatever. It has uh, an Aero B booster on top and on the bottom, it is using a Vanguard boosted stage, but it is a very lightweight Vanguard boosted stage down the bottom. Uh, it's gonna take a couple of weeks to build it and uh, we should be able to reach the altitudes with it. So there we go, two weeks, flicker, flicker, flash, flash. Yeah, if you are sens sensitive to flashing lights, you probably shouldn't have watched that. Um, if you are suffering from some sort of seizure right now, please contact your local doctor and don't blame me. After all, I did warn you after the fact. Okay, so the downside of the vehicle assembly building is you though you have to roll the stuff out of storage to the launch pad instead of just like driving it out of the hangar. And here goes our inaugural Soundwave Extreme rocket launch. So we ro throttle things up, fire that engine, listen to that beautiful sound there. And the thrust doesn't show anything sensible, but it doesn't matter, we're going to fly this thing into space. Okay, so, yeah, it's your standard sounding rocket. It's using the Vanguard stage, which is a whole lot more powerful, meaning that this first stage booster is pretty, you know, it's pretty capable. 
Well, you see that we're up to like 1500 meters per second, we got 2 kilometers per second, 2.5, 3 kilometers per second, and then the aerobee kicks in and carries us a little further, a little higher. It just basically keeps on going. Remember, 1600 kilometers or thereabouts was the target. Are we going to get there? Well, absolutely no problem. Look, I get tons of fuel left. Well, not literally tons, but it looks like I have quite a large portion of my fuel load left. And we're passing through 2,000 kilometers. You'll also notice that I managed to put the pressure sensor off center and the whole thing is still stable. Also notice, as I time accelerate forwards, the spacecraft continues to rotate thanks to the persistent rotation mod, which basically means when you go on rails, the rotation will continue and your spacecraft no longer... You can't basically use time acceleration anymore to freeze your offsets. So that's us got our altitude records. We're going to get up to like 2,700 or thereabouts. Look at the Earth below as you can actually see a significant part of the United States, including the Great Lakes. You can see uh, Florida, the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, large parts of the Atlantic. This is truly a pioneering moment in space history. I just wish we had a camera so we could actually take some pictures. Then I wish we actually weren't spinning so fast that the pictures all came out blurred. So that is a uh, successful launch from Wallops Island. Oh yeah, you can see all the way over to the west coast as well. The whole of the United States is visible from our view on up high or something like that. Yeah, uh, Wallops, they tended to like just develop the t and test hardware before it was actually launched from Florida. But they have actually launched real missions. One that you might remember was the, the Laddie, the Lunar Dust Environment Explorer, which was launched on top of a Minotaur rocket, solid rocket boosters, took off like a shot, and pretty much did this to a frog that happened to be in the, the water you know, sound control system. <laughs> Okay, so new contracts. What do we have? Pass the Carmen line. The Carmen line is the line at which the speed necessary to main altitude via lift is the same as the speed required for orbit. It's the traditional dividing line between the atmosphere and space. Although, to be fair, there is actually a whole lot of atmosphere above that. Okay, we're not going to get into lunar orbit. Uh, not going to manage a lunar impact or lunar flyby. Um, yeah, no, no, we, oh, space data from space, that science data from space, we can get that, sounding rocket. Well, okay, we'll leave those for now. The X-plane is, is going to require level flight, so that's not going to happen. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. So we're going to basically send some volunteer up in a space-capable capsule. Okay, we don't actually have the technology for space capsules, but we do have the technology for supersonic rocket-powered space planes. Uh, planes. Well, this is going to become a space plane, hopefully. Uh, what we've done is basically drop it on top, top of a rocket powered by a Soviet RD-103. The RD-103 was a German-derived design, I believe. Uh, Gl or Glushko actually specifically said, here marks the end of the German rockets or whatever in this Soviet space program. Uh, it was originally used for intercontinental... It wasn't intercontinental, sorry. It was used for theater ballistic missiles. They, they didn't have intercontinental ranges. Uh, in this case, it ran on you know, German-type fuel mixtures of ethanol and liquid oxygen. Uh, there we go, ethanol 75, liquid oxygen, and we're flying up. We have a new pilot, Andre. Andre is our pilot. And we're just, just fixing that there. Now you notice we have pretty substantial wings on that launch stage. That is to keep the whole thing heavy. If you have wings on the front, you need bigger wings on the rear, otherwise your center of lift will be in the wrong place. And off we go. Now, at this point, we don't actually have enough thrust to counteract gravity, but that doesn't really matter because we're just wanting to maintain our acceleration. 88 kilometers, 89, 90, 90 kilometers. We've got to get above 191. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. Come on! Don't let me down! 
19. Or don't let me down until after we've achieved our altitude. 100 kilometers. That is us. We're going to pass the Carmen line and we're going to keep going. And I am having some control issues. I'm pitching all the way down and all the way forwards. And I, I'm start, I cannot keep the thing straight. I suspect there is a thrust versus center of mass issue here. Um, yeah, all we did was we basically took the existing space plane design, or space plane, the existing X-1 supersonic test plane design and just stuck it on top of a rocket. So it's unsurprising that it's not really capable of flying in space. There, one more go here. Oh, yeah, that's not going to work. Come on, throttle, 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 throttle. Yeah, and that spins us around again. Still, we have achieved 112 kilometer altitude here. So we're going to float up uh, while uh, our test pilot spins in a most peculiar way. <gasps> but for the first time, he can see stars during day daytime. Now that is something special, something no other Kerbal has seen, and hopefully he will be able to return to tell the story. Uh, we, we never really thought about developing this into a space plane or whatever, so it doesn't have a reaction control system. We will have to apply these things. I record crew assessment of the situation, and basic telemetry and operating data are also recorded. Great! And we're about to max out our altitude. Crew report. Oh, I thought we already had that. There we go. Upper atmosphere above the grasslands. And 1,200... Or 112... 200... 300! Uh, 112 kilometers, 300 meters, and now we are falling back to Kerbin. Now this is the tricky part, because we hope that we can regain some kind of control. The, the real danger is that we end up going nose first and we can't pull out of the dive and we can't slow down quickly enough. All the same, I think we really want to take advantage of this opportunity to go for a new speed record. So we're going to end up nose down once the atmosphere starts to bite. And once the atmosphere starts to bite as it is now, we can light up the engine and perhaps get a little faster. So I think the next step in my speed records is about 1,200 meters per second. Come on, get your nose pointed down. Okay, I, I think we've got enough atmosphere. It's time for us to hit the rockets. Go! 1,100 meters per second. Oh, get control there. And 1,200. Okay, can we go for 1,500? Can we go for... Oh, no, I think so. I think we are having some wobbling. Time to cut this out. Uh-oh. 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 We are in some sort of spin. Look at the G-forces building there. Like eight Gs. Oh, gee, this is really hard. This is really hard. So this is some sort of weird spin situation here. Uh, okay. Get control of this. Get control. You're running out of altitude to fix this problem, although we still have the parachute on hand, but we all know how well that worked for Vadim. Everyone knows Vadim and remembered him. He was such a happy, smiley person until he, well, met his fate. Okay, looks like we're getting control. Get control, and I pull out of this dive. Yeah, look at that! So we went subsonic, and now we can actually come out of this dive, and this is my final relight. I can only fire this engine four times. After that, I lack the ability to relight it. So if you... And, and to land safely, we need to burn off all the fuel, which is kind of important. Otherwise, you end up hitting the ground too fast due to having too much mass on board. Plus, having liquid oxygen and... Uh, Rocket fuel on board is probably not that safe either. I mean, regardless, we've got some control here. We're just going to boost this thing back up to altitude, fly towards our target, and then hopefully, having saved a bit of time, we shall return to uh, base and land on the parachute. Now, since the previous flights, we have actually made some changes. We moved the wings backwards just a bit to make it more stable. We moved the parachute back, hoping that the parachute would... 
uh, hoping that it would be closer to the center of mass. But that's that's always hard because you know you then unfuel it and refuel it and never seems to quite work out. Still, the parachute does actually open, and when it's open, the spacecraft, well, it's not really a spacecraft, we're not really sure what to call it, the suborbital experimental test vehicle sits rather nicely under the parachute until it lands. And coming down, three, two, one, touchdown! Arcady whatever his surname, can we just call him Arcady Kerman for just easy access? Arcady has become the highest and fastest Kerbal of them all and he survived to tell the tale. A tale which talks about being able to see stars during the daytime sky, how he flew to such altitude the sky was a deep, deep black. 304,000 we've got now. Ar Arcady Simmerman? Oh, yeah. oh, Simmerman, I guess. It's almost... But in future episodes, he will go higher and faster still. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>